Marty Hogan. Davy Bledsoe will be in very good position. Hogan gets. Bledsoe dives and gets. Hogan and Bledsoe. I don't believe it. Bledsoe, can he do it again? Welcome to Racquetball Video Magazine. I'm Gene Levanchi. Racquetball Video Magazine is a new series of videos which will provide racquetball enthusiasts with information, instruction, and in the Silver Anniversary Edition, a historical look at the first 25 years of this exciting sport. We'll take you back to the early years of racquetball and show you how the game has changed in a quarter century. You'll learn of the champions who helped change the course of the sport, from yesterday's heroes to today's stars. And in a very special segment, we'll meet four legendary players who are synonymous with racquetball. Two of the stars whose names transcend the sport will help us commemorate the silver anniversary. The Gar. It's a simple title for a man who has been a racquetball champion almost since the sport's inception. Charlie Garfinkel has won nearly 200 racquetball tournaments in his career. At 6 feet 6 inches tall, this 19-time national amateur champion has been a true tower in the sport. During a three-year stretch from 1984 to 1987, the GAR won five national amateur titles, 27 straight tournaments, and 101 straight matches. Garfinkel authored two top-selling racquetball books and hundreds of articles for publications worldwide. A real character, the GAR's accomplishments have had a great impact on the sport. Charlie, thanks for being with us. Gene, thanks for the kind words. A real pleasure to be here. Karen McKinney is one of racquetball's most influential citizens both on and off the court. A three-time president of the Women's Professional Racquetball Association, McKinney reached the top of her game in 1989, when she was the WPRA national champion and the number one female player in the world, all of which earned her WPRA Player of the Year honors. A great ambassador for the sport, McKinney is one of the game's premier instructors as she tirelessly travels, teaches, and promotes racquetball internationally. She is a true champion of the game. Karen, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you, Gene. It's a great opportunity to be here. We're pleased to have both with us to share their experiences, knowledge, and insight as we salute the silver anniversary of racquetball. <laughs> Racquetball was derived from the game of paddle ball. In the late 1940s, Joe Sobeck, an inventive Connecticut paddle baller, decided he didn't like the sound of the wooden paddle on the ball. So he sawed off the bottom of an old tennis racket, and racquetball was born. However, in the sport's infancy, it wasn't called racquetball. The game was referred to as paddle rackets. Even the word racket was spelled differently, using a K rather than the Q-U as we know it today. It wasn't until 1968 when the name Paddle Rackets was changed to Racquetball. That's right, Karen. Also during the 60s is when the reins of Racquetball were turned over to a gentleman by the name of Bob Kendler. Kendler, an Illinois businessman, was the founder and director of the United States Handball Association. When he saw the excitement generated by Racquetball and the potential impact it could have on handball, he decided to take an active role in the development of the sport. So he organized the International Racquetball Association, better known as the IRA. To help us better understand those early years, which were not only very exciting, but very controversial, we talked with Chuck Levy. Chuck and his father, Mort, were very instrumental in the growth of racquetball. Both worked closely with Kendler, the IRA, and with the development of the Pro Tour. My, my dad, um, um, Mort Levy, was uh, the executive... Uh, secretary of the U.S. Handball Association and uh, that organization was run by a man named Bob Kendler. In 1968, uh, Bob got a call from a guy named Larry Lederman in Milwaukee who ran the uh, Jewish Community Center up there. It was a very strong handball hotbed in Milwaukee. Lederman told Kendler and my dad that there was this new sport that uh, they were playing up there and they ought to come and take a look at it because it really looked like it was catching on and had a good future. 
and it was played on a handball court, therefore it could pose a threat to handball, and uh, perhaps Ken Lerner and my dad might prefer to get behind it rather than, you know, be in conflict with it. And, and Lederman organized a tournament uh, that brought together players from 14 states, from as far away as Memphis and Louisville, uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, all sorts of different places. And it was really, as my dad uh, tells the story, uh, kind of an interesting group of people with of such a variety of rackets. Some people even brought solid paddles. Uh, people brought balls of varying sizes and colors and, and, and liveliness. Uh, there were no rules. You know, nobody knew what they were doing really, except that they were all playing some variation of this this game, which uh, was coined paddle rackets at the time. Um, to differentiate it from paddle ball, which was played with a solid wood, solid wooden paddle. And um, in 1968 in Milwaukee, what was important was that uh, people realized that this was happening elsewhere. There was a group in Louisville, there was a group in Memphis, there was a group in Michigan, there was a group in Chicago and out in Iowa, and there was talk of people on the West Coast already playing this thing, and, and, and that it was happening. And so if it was happening, it needed to be structured, there needed to be a direction, there needed to be uh, some kind of cohesiveness that could bring everybody together and, and develop some common rules and develop a publication and do all the things that, that are necessary for an industry to begin. And so uh, in the fall of 1968, the International Paddle Rackets Association was formed. And um, within a year, the name was changed to International Racquetball Association. Uh, paddle rackets, it was determined, well, a cute name that, that everybody seemed to like, didn't really describe it. Is it a paddle or is it a racket? So they decided to uh, uh, call it racquetball and put in the CQU to give it its, its uh, uniqueness, I suppose. One of the things that Bob Kenler knew had to happen was that there had to be a, a strong financial base to the sport, to the association, if it was going to not only survive, but thrive. What was needed were, were significant dollars to help promote the sport. And uh, the people who stood to gain, uh, in Kendler's opinion, were the manufacturers. If the sport grew, uh, that's where the money would be. So he went, uh, he went out trying to uh, find somebody to make a ball for him. One company said, yeah, we'll give it a try with you. And that was Seamless, which then became Seamco. And they made a deal that uh, they'd produce this ball f for uh, Kendler, and, uh, or for the IRA, and in return the association would get paid a dollar a dozen. So as the sport grew, so would the money for the association. And um, that was it. And so that became the official ball. And first year, uh, there was like $19,000 in royalties and nobody paid any attention to it. And second year, it got up to about $50,000. And everybody said, oh, that's interesting. Third year, when it hit $180,000, people took notice and started wondering, oh, gee, where's all the money going? And, you know, you know this looks like something's going to happen here. You know, uh, do we want Bob Kendler and his uh, dominant personality and style to uh, be in charge of this thing if it's going to grow like this? Some of those people had reached a position of authority within the IRA on their board of directors. And in 1973, a lot of um, infighting came to a head uh, in St. Louis at, at board meetings in, in the Nationals. Actually, it predated that. It goes back to a, an event in December of 1972 in Minneapolis, where uh, there was a board meeting held, and it was proposed that new bylaws for the IRA be created, which would effectively um, strip Bob Kendler of, of most of his powers. To make a long story short, um, in St. Louis in 1973, the board uh, voted and uh, by a narrow margin uh, elected to change the bylaws to, to um, relieve Bob Kendler of, uh, of his responsibilities. And um, you know, they, they offered him to retain the presidency but with, you know, far uh, reduced uh, a role. And uh, I remember the meeting as if it was yesterday. Uh, Kemmler got up and turned to the group and he said, I will be no man's unit, and walked out. So uh, Kemmler, Kemmler was gone, and the IRA was left to go on its way with um, the new group, which uh, 
uh, eventually became headed by uh, first DeWitt Shy for a year and then Myron Roderick and, and all that history. You know, I had a choice. Do I want to go with the IRA? Do I want to go with Kenley? Well, with my family history and, and allegiance to the man, I stuck with him. So um, he said, well, now what are we going to do? <laughs> and, and we just decided uh, that we needed to do something new, something different that uh, would catch the imagination and, and the excitement of the sport. And to us, it was obvious, uh, pro racquetball. So um, in the summer of 1973, we began planning um, the pro game. And then, um, historically speaking, we, we caught a break. Um, while we didn't see ourselves being a threat to anybody, uh, just an enhancement for the best players and hopefully getting some TV coverage for the sport eventually, maybe bringing in some corporate sponsorships which would expand the pie. That was what we saw ourselves doing. Uh, there were still people at the IRA who viewed us as a threat and they decided to get into pro racquetball. And Kendler's response was, then we're getting into amateur racquetball. And so uh, that, that we became, we had the NRC, the National Racquetball Club, which was our pro organization, and then that then came the U.S. Racquetball Association, which was formed as, a, as an amateur group, and then it was war. You know, the IRA and pros, and their pros and their amateurs, and us with our pros and our amateurs. And so in 75, 76, 77, it was, you know, it was their tour and our tour, and, and manufacturers were pressured to line up on one or the other. And uh, it, it started not to be so much fun, <laughs> and and uh, it was difficult. Um, finally, um, peace was made, so to speak, and um, you know things started to settle down a little bit toward the end of the '70s. The tour was exciting because what was happening was, I mean, we got off to that rough start in '73, '74 when we only pulled off four events, and. Uh, uh, but in, in, in 74, 75, uh, we were able to put together eight. And the next year, the, we doubled the prize money, and we doubled the prize money again. And, and there was opportunity for players, and there was growth, and there was television coverage, and there was Marty Hogan and the superstars, and, and all these kinds of things. And, and so, um, it, you know, there was good and there was bad, but on the balance sheet, we felt there, there was more good, a lot more good. And perhaps my biggest enjoyment, I think, was in bringing this to people for the first time, to go into cities where they'd never seen the tour, uh, and, and making sure, you know, promoting the sport locally, getting full galleries, and then getting there to that Friday night uh, on the night of the quarterfinals, and I'd get on the microphone and I, I'd be able to say, and now sit back and enjoy yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, because you're going to see something you've never seen before. And not knowing who was going to come out of the quarters and just watching the athleticism and, and the incredible skills that these guys were, were, were displaying. Um, that was fun and exciting and, and uh, probably, you know, my biggest enjoyment um, were, were those memories. It was just, it was, a, it was a great time to be in racquetball.